the World Economic Forum estimated there are going to be 85 million jobs displaced by automation, artificial intelligence in a very short time frame. In the same time, though, 95 million new jobs and roles will be created. So there's a huge opportunity, right? Many of the jobs that exist today won't exist tomorrow. The challenges in front of us are, are big, for sure. But the opportunities are, are, are enormous as well. And, and this may be one of the most exciting times to have been alive on this planet. Welcome back to another episode of Wise On Air, the show where we talk to the world's leading minds on the future of education. My name is Basim Hijazi, producer of the show. One billion young people are expected to enter the workforce this decade. How can we ensure that young people are equipped and have access to as many opportunities as possible? Meet Taha and Omar Bawa, the brothers behind Goodwall. Goodwall is an app and online platform that upskills young talent and prepares them for future career success. While they develop skills, Goodwall supports them to drive change and tackle global challenges, from the climate crisis to mental health. Some have described Goodwall as a platform that mixes LinkedIn with TikTok, making for a space that resonates with Gen Z and also enables them to learn and showcase skills to prospective employers. Since founding Goodwall, they've helped more than 2 million young people, 60% female, in more than 150 countries navigate their learning and earning journeys. Omar and Taha started Goodwall to inspire and encourage the next generation to achieve more and impact society positively. Stay tuned to hear Wise director and host of this episode, Elias Filfoul, as he delves deeper into how the idea for Goodwall came about and how skills are going to be the currency of the future of work. Okay. I'm very happy to have this conversation, uh, Omar and Taha. I've been following your work uh, for many years. I think this is the first time that uh, you are together in, in, in a podcast or in a conversation, right? Or in a, on a panel or anything. Yep. So I'm, I'm, I love to be the first <laughs> of doing something. And I'm so happy to have this conversation with you. Well, thank you so much, Elias, for, for having us and for supporting us throughout this journey. I want to go back to your kind of childhood. If you come back to the kids, the, the Taha and Omar, were you dreaming of becoming an entrepreneur? And what are some of the, you know, some of the things that sparked in you the desire to do something that is solving a problem? So for me, I actually had no aspiration or intention to become an entrepreneur or build a business. I don't even necessarily like the word. Um, but in a way, if you look at sort of our inception or, or why we created Goodwall in the first place, um, we are born into a humanitarian family of sorts, you could say. Our father served the UNHCR to help refugees in Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, the last Gulf War um, for more than 30 years. And growing up, we benefited from some of the best education and opportunities you could get. But at the same time, um, we had the opportunity to spend our summer vacations, you know, visiting refugee camps alongside our father. Um, and I think you refer to whether there was a specific moment that maybe triggered the beginning of this journey. For me, I think I was seven or eight years old. Ata and I, we were visiting a refugee camp with our father. And I think I asked myself this question of why were we the kids distributing the candy to other kids our mm. own age, right? Mm. They were also seven, eight, nine, we were playing together. But they had just gone through the horrors of war. They had lost everything. Whereas uh, the two of us were out there, you know, distributing candy. And that maybe got us to ask ourselves the question why that was the case, uh, why there was this opportunity gap um, at an early age. Over time, of course, that that then evolved. Um, I think in the core DNA of what we built, there was always a, a vision of the world that we wanted to see come true. Uh, we wanted to bridge this opportunity gap, level the playing field for youth everywhere. And the best vehicle towards achieving that was building a social enterprise yeah. or building a company um, versus this idea of like, oh, I want to build a company. Let me go figure out what that was. Do you endorse everything here? <laughs> I completely <laughs> I was like, I was like, you check. I was like, do, do our notes match? Yes. Um, no, I, I, I think one thing Omar told me, because he's the one who convinced me to, 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 to start this with him. I, I was not sold on, on, on the entrepreneurial journey at, at first, but he was like, if you don't come with me, I'm going to do it by myself. And I was like, look, I have to, I have to come now. And he was very, very insistent. Um, I think one thing that he said that stuck with me was, um, you know, we can't change the world. 
the two of us. It almost felt at that time, I was very disappointed. I was very cynical. Like a lot of young people, when you look around and you say that the world isn't working how it should work, mm. it's not fair. But I'm just one small thing. Like, what can I do? And Omar said, actually, okay, you can't do anything. But what if you could help 100 million other young people get the opportunities we got to have, let's say, the ability, and then give them also the, the, the exposure to want to do something? Mm. Then we're changing the world. And, and that's kind of the journey we're on now. You know, the, the journey we're on now is to create 100 million change makers. But first, you have to give them the opportunities. The opportunities to be able to do something and also the exposure at a young age. I don't believe we're here talking about doing social good because we're necessarily good people. I, I believe it's because of the exposure we had growing up. Yeah. So we have to give that exposure to other young people around the world and then give them the chance to say, yeah, I would like to give back as well and, yeah. and work appropriately. That's what we have to do when it comes to climate. You know, it doesn't happen by itself. It happens because of your exposure. And so that really convinced me. And, um, and regarding you know, actually setting up this sort of a vehicle, we just felt that, you know, there's a paradigm within which we live. How, how can we navigate that? And I thought the vehicle of leveraging technology, sustainability, is, is probably the one that can achieve our goal fastest. And, and finally, partnerships, right? As, as we talked about on the panel, you work alongside organizations that are complementary to you, whether they be small civil society organizations, whether that be the UN, whether that be governments. Whether it be what <laughs> <laughs> this concept of trying to give back is is so powerful and and the access as well and we discussed about it. Uh, I don't think I would be able to do this podcast with you if my family also did not move to Canada when I was twelve yep. and just get me access to a better education. That quickly we understood that this is an opportunity and and the fact that you also had that opportunity and now you're given back that's that's very powerful how much your own education has also um i don't know impacted your journey or or because right now what you're trying to do also with your solution is you're trying to rethink the learning experience that's going to lead young people yeah. to better opportunities yeah. how much your own education have led you to to what you are versus versus actually you realize quickly that the best way to get educated is your own way to create it, your learning pathway. Yeah, in terms of the learning experience and how we might see it differently, perhaps to others, right? There's a big emphasis in terms of the way we've done it at Goodwall on both what we refer to as social learning and experiential learning, right? So it's learning by doing and learning by seeing what others have done. And this is particularly relevant today. If we've seen with artificial intelligence and automation, the way in which we've learned until today for the last hundred years is based on a knowledge-based yeah. learning system, if I could say, right? And the value of knowledge in today's environment has significantly reduced given the, the access to it. But when it comes to skills and the ability to actually get a job done, you actually learn that by doing the thing yeah. primarily. So experiential and social yeah. learning, complemented, of course, by traditional learning. Um, so really, really excited to see where that takes and us. And you went through that, that journey of trying to learn by experimenting things and your, your the, the development of Goodwall also came up from that kind of mindset? In terms of our personal journey, I'd say we had a very holistic learning experience, mm. right? It wasn't just limited to what we had in the classroom. I think mm -hmm. our extracurricular activities definitely played a role. Yeah. Our parents played a significant role. The experiences mm -hmm. that we had growing up, uh, the causes we were a part of, um, really shaped our vision, right? Yeah. Um, and if we're able to give that experience to as many young people as possible, then I think oh. we can, yeah. yeah, that's very powerful. Yeah, just picking up on that, I can't agree more. When we, we it was mentioned today at the, on the panel, experiential learning is, is has been, at least when we were starting out, there was just not much of it. Mm. It was work that was happening in the classroom. And we said, actually, when we look back at what really drove us and what you know, built up our skills, it was the things outside of the classroom. You know, we learned how to communicate, how to navigate a room, how to, um, you know, the self-confidence. A lot of that comes through some of the projects we did, Model United Nations, volunteering, um, connecting to people from other parts of the world. And this is all happening while you're in high school. Mm. Um, and, and that's what we tried to replicate with Goodwall because the curriculum didn't allow for it systematically. The other thing is, you know, we, 
I would say everyone should have the best higher education. But you know, there's almost a billion young people going to enter the workforce. Yeah. So it's just not It's not going to solve the problem. Yeah. But, you know, in the same way some people like to have a Porsche, that's fine. But the Porsche should not be a prerequisite to having access to a dignified livelihood. Mm. And it's the same thing for higher education, in my, my, my opinion. You know, you don't have to go to the best universities in the world to be able to access opportunities. But I would like to go back to university. I mm. think it's amazing. It's, 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 it, I love learning and I love the experience of tertiary education. But it's just not possible to scale that level of, per, of, 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 let's say, that cost, at least as it is today, to a billion people. And so that's where we also have to look at how can we find opportunities of learning that are relevant to drive dignified livelihoods, because that's our principal concern for our society. If we're unable to do that, especially with climate change accentuating inequality, mm. there is a real risk that our society disintegrates as we yeah. know it. Yeah. And you know what, what I what I really like from some of the things you, you you mentioned at the panel is and we take it we take it for granted from from our kind of level where you were focusing on on skills such as navigating a room. I mean, who, who think about it? But it's so important. Yeah. I mean, if 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 we give a, an opportunity to a young person to be in a room full of full of decision makers, they will freeze. Yeah. And that is, is a little soft skill that they, they need to learn. And and uh, what are some of the top skills that you you have been tracking success uh, from your users uh, so far with with Goodwill? Yeah, I can, and then feel free to compliment on that. Just picking up on that particular point, I yeah. think, you know, we, we, we spoke about it within the context of a program we're running to to get, to help train and skill up future leaders in the climate space. And what we realized was we want, ultimately, you have to have the right base, you know, the right, and that base is from doing. Mm. So you don't want to take the best talkers and make them future leaders. What you'd like to do is take the best doers yeah. who have a track record and then help upskill them to become talkers. The, the reverse is harder. Mm. And um, what we realized was with this with this first program, which is with the Vis Academy for Nature, I was in Kenya two weeks ago, and the young people were all in one area because they are doers. They're doers in their local communities. They don't know how to navigate a room. And there was various high-profile individuals and funders. And, and, and the ambassador came to me who was hosting us, and he said, um, Ta, why has nobody come up to me? <laughs> because, I see, you know, in another setting, he would be... He would, be, tar he would be targeted. <laughs> he was all by himself. Yeah. And, and I said, yeah, we're working on that module. Yeah. They haven't reached that module yeah. yet of how to navigate the room. Yeah. And you see this repeatedly. So when we talk about youth participation from a policy, diverse youth participation from a policy perspective, it's not enough to put them in the room. Mm. One has to train them to say, okay, you're sitting next to the CEO of Unilever. Here you have, you know, 15 seconds. E you know, you're, you're, you have 15 seconds to gather his attention. How mm. do you go about it? So coming back to your question, the, the 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 skills we've looked at are entrepreneurial thinking. Mm -hmm. So just to come, and I'll speak about that because it's something that we we benefited a lot from. Even if we didn't think we'd be entrepreneurs, we were exposed to that very young. Entrepreneurial thinking, communication skills, digital skills, um, certain hard skills or introduction to certain hard skills. Um, mm -hmm. uh, for example, from technology, um, uh, certain AI, uh, for example, but. Um, really worked on a lot of the soft skills mm. because I think what I mentioned was all young people need to learn how to learn. That's that's super powerful when you mentioned that at the at the panel. It's just just how do you how do you train your your yourself on on adapting and, and keep learning and, and learn and relearn. And that, that, that is like hundred percent correlated with resilience and adaptability as you yeah. said. And so what can you do to drive that as early as possible? So that requires failure, of course. Mm. That requires going outside of your comfort zone. That requires putting yourself out there. So if I come back to that entrepreneurial um, skill set, uh, we, I, I think it was, we were 16, I started watching Dragon's Den, which mm -hmm. is the British version of Shark Tank. Mm -hmm. And I remember being fascinated by it. And, 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 and just like starting to judge people, starting to judge ideas. This isn't good. That's good. <laughs> you know, of course, I wasn't ready to pitch, but I was definitely ready to judge. Were you an investor? I was, I was like, that's a, that's a no for me, you know. <laughs> but, but what we realized was, you know, there you were, like, at the same time, there was an entrepreneurship program at our school, like, to, to, to teach you. And they were like, sli essentially slides. 
I don't remember anything yeah. from those slides. You learned much more from that. But I learned from this gentleman or woman speaking and pitching their idea. Yeah. And you see, okay, hey, that's the business plan. What's the model? Okay, how do, how do they distribute? How is he speaking or she speaking? And, and, and that actually inspired us to build what we have today, which is should be the largest digital entrepreneurship program in the world. Last year, we funded ideas in 100 countries. Mm. And that was just young people pitching their ideas essentially in video format. Other young people vote on them. And then we have a jury and we send out the money this like every single day. We funded an idea every day. And wow. we're hoping to scale, scale that. Now we're, we're in collaboration with the Rwandan government to get every young person in Rwanda to go through such an experiential entrepreneurial program. Yeah. So anyways, all of that to say, that was something that wasn't included in the curriculum. We had a bit of a funky teacher who allowed us to like watch Dragon's Den. Um, or what Shark a story Dark. of transformation, by the way, Rwanda. I'm so happy that you're collaborating with them because that's another transfer. Uh, that's another story that need to be shared at large. I mean, how do you, how do you move from a country that you had genocide 20 years ago to a more one of the most innovative innovative you know city and country in yeah. in, in, in not only on the continent and. Yeah. The Swiss of Africa. Yeah. Yes, you guys. <laughs> it feels like Geneva. Yeah. It's, Rwanda, it's Geneva, yeah. 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 Yeah, you were there last year. Yeah, I was there last year. No, I think it's 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 an incredible story. And we're seeing, and of course, you need leadership. Um, but it's it's an incredible story of the resilience of the people. So on leadership, uh, uh, Omar and, and Ta, I've been fascinating. So the past seven years, I've been helping running the Wise Accelerator. And I've been working with founders and co-founders and it the foundation of of a startup a company and a, and and, a, and any project is is the quality of the co-foundership and uh I've, I've seen super amazing ideas you know but then the co-foundership was not aligned and very quickly how and i and I, I know this is this is <laughs> This may be an easy or maybe a tough one. You 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 judge and let me know. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> I I wanna. I, I'm fascinating, but both of you as brother and co-founders, how do you navigate? Uh, how do you navigate the very deep personal relationship versus the business and 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 where do you complement yourself and where do you, you know, you you you, you yeah you, you kind of one cover the weakness of the other. Uh, versus and, and strength uh, versus weakness. Thank you, Elias. Um... And I'm and I'm <laughs> and I'm saying this with a lot of fascination, by no, the way, because you've been you. you've been you've been running this for many years. So basically, you have a case, you have a successful case <laughs> to share. It's not it's not like you're beginning and yeah, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we've been really fortunate, I think, to share this journey. I don't think we would be where we are today if we hadn't embarked on this together. It's been, in many ways, I feel our edge or our advantage that we've been able to, well, I've been able to co-found Goodwall with my brother. Um, I think what it really does come down to is trust. There, when you're looking for a co-founder, you're trying to build you know, something bigger than yourself. Um, when it does get really, really hard, that trust and that knowledge or that belief that you know the other person who you're building this with has your back at all times no and what, you have yeah. their back yeah. um i think is incredibly powerful um in terms of us being complementary as well i think our roles have very much evolved throughout the journey of of, of the company right if i think back to my own journey when i initially started i always wore perhaps more of the creative hat mm -hmm. it was about leading product design engineering growth I've worn, at this point in time, mm -hmm. almost, I've done the full circle of the entire organization. Um, more recently, partnerships, uh, relations with our investors, and so on. Meanwhile, you know, Ta has taken the lead in um, our external relations in leading our teams, in creating a team, mm -hmm. right? Inspiring our team um, and bringing it all together, seeing our strategy, where are we going next? Yeah. If I may, Sorry. I think... Uh, I think a, a key element as well is pushing each other. Yeah. Right. So you you have to keep growing as the organization evolves and grows, and you have to essentially reinvent yourself and improve yourself. Because you know the person who went from literally you know zero people to ten to to X um, has to change their skill set and their abilities. And I think we push each other, and I don't think there's anyone that can be harsher 
on me than him and vice versa. <laughs> I mean, we're incredibly tough on each other and our yeah, expectations are, yeah. are, are very, yeah. very, uh, our expectations are very high. <clears throat> we know what each other's capabilities are in, in our relative strengths and we expect full, mm. full intensity and full commitment. And there can be no wavering on that. And you know you're going to get it. And, and that's important, right? Because it's not just, okay, do you have talent? But can you maintain intensity over prolonged periods of time? Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, is critical. And the other thing is just to enjoy it. You know, yeah. we, we are obsessed with this problem and are obsessed with also, not the solution, but we're obsessed with what we do. Yeah. So for us, you know, if, yes, if we, we meet up, unfortunately for you, this you know conversation is likely going to end up speaking about something either directly or tangentially related to this space. Mm. Might not be good wall, but at least the space because this is our, this is this is what we're obsessed with. We love this. We think it's one of the most important, if not the most important, problem to solve, and so we love talking about it. So at 10 p.m. on any given <laughs> Thursday, the chances Sunday's are included. wow. The chances are we're speaking about this right. on a weekend. Actually, you you, you saw my mom. Yeah. You know, if you were to ask her, <laughs> what really annoys her is that that's all we, that's a lot of what we talk about. We love wow. it. Wow. So, so it's a chance for me to also spend time with my brother and talk about what we love, yeah. which is this. Yeah. We love yeah. this. We, we, we actually enjoy it. So it's not, it's not like, you know, when we call each other, we're talking about work at 10 o'clock. No, it's like, hey, did you no, think really about care. this? It's like, yeah. hey, did you think about, how do you see that going? Yeah. We had this yeah. interesting conversation and. Now, my mom hasn't had it so well. Like, actually, if, if you do talk to her, she was like, can you guys stop? Like, just stop. <laughs> and it's on holidays, it's on weekends, but it's for us, it's not, it's fun. And then that's, uh, I think that's, that's the most important recipe for success. Because uh, I, I feel even if you were not brothers, it would have, that, that's the recipe, basically. You need the trust. You need to make sure you're super passionate about it. You need to make sure that you push, you know, other. each other. Uh, and also, I mean, I, I, I am, I, I am in fascination with people who find a problem and just dis dedicate 10 years of their life to solve it. And then the average is, is 10 years. Yeah. Uh, how the problem have evolved? Cause, cause yeah. probably you, when you started and maybe, maybe tell the audience, when did you start and yeah. what's the context when you started? Because most probably I am sure that the product have evolved. Yeah. And I am sure that the way you're looking at solving the problem yeah. have evolved. Can you can you just share with us the context where you started this, yeah. and and no. where we are now, and where potentially you see? Oh, you know what? We might go, you know, a little bit more left, a little bit more right because of AI, because of climate change potentially yeah. uh, affecting the 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 future of work and the opportunities for you, these young people around the world. Yeah, I can share a little on that, and or maybe you. Can, I don't know how much you're willing, you 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 can share on some of the stuff you're working on um, that that will come out soon. Um, but uh, <laughs> oh, that was like whoa. Well, 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 we didn't, we didn't That's say, an example of <laughs> to to want a premiere. <laughs> I, I mean, know. I had the premiere of having you both. I just keep going with the scoop. <laughs> but. Um, when we when we started, we, we started very you know very narrowly, which was only high school kids. Yeah. Because the, the logic was the place where you can change mindsets is the best place is, is high school. Um, so 16 to 18. And the reason for that is below or 14 to 18. The, below that you need parental supervision or you need schools. And schools are essentially enterprise sales without the money. Right? And so it's difficult to get that distribution. And then on the other side, you have, you know, if it's too late. It becomes like with every year passing by, you have your habits in place and it becomes harder to change mindsets. So that's the place. And of course you can, you know, they're fast adopters, uh, they're, 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 they're digitally literate, et cetera. So, um, so we started with that demographic and we really focused on, you know, being able to create your first portfolio, essentially your pre LinkedIn. Mm. Right? And that was, and very quickly we added on features. We realized we very quickly, we became, this had to be social, you know, it, you, you had to have connections with each other. You needed to connect to opportunities. And we started off with university opportunities, but we realized, and this is what we're talking about, higher education just doesn't work mm. for a billion people. Mm. This is just not a viable solution. And that's where we developed our own skill pathways or programs where we got alongside corporates. Um, we, we would build these, uh, the, these skill-based micro-learning, if you would like, which is peer-to-peer, -peer, all within the community. And um, today, 
uh, we serve 16 to essentially 30, depending on the age. What you Because in certain countries, youth goes up to 30. In other countries, it's 16 to 24 or 16 to 22. We're essentially serving the youth populace and helping them <clears throat> essentially showcase who they are when they don't have much to show. Mm. That's the key element. When you have nothing to show, let's help you show yourself. All of that within a community, accessing skilling opportunities and finally opportunities from our partners, so scholarships, internships, and jobs. That's where we are today. I think part of where we'd like to go is strengthen um, the pathways mm. for young people to access dignified livelihoods mm -hmm. and, employment. and employment without needing centralized credentialing that you pay for. So what that means is, uh, practically, can you get young people to participate in a bunch of different programs that are contextualized, localized for them that can be recognized at a global level mm. um, and then access opportunities. I think one other thing that we didn't expect to do, but that we do and hopefully will scale a lot is the entrepreneurial thinking and financing. Mm -hmm. So what we do is the top of the funnel. So we get young people in, we get them engaged, we get them to go through a micro training, pitch their ideas and get the first funding up to $3,000 in different tranches. Last year, we funded ideas, as I mentioned, 100 countries, almost one a day. We're aiming to scale that to one a minute. Wow. So what does that mean? Like literally people are notified on the app every minute that people are being paid out. So it really shows that there's a movement. Trust. It builds trust. And it shows that, especially for underrepresented populations, like for women, that actually you can There's still room to invest or not, uh, not, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you can win. Then you can make it. Then, then you can make it. Um, and that's so important. But then after, and this is critical, this is what we've been working on this week, with Generation Unlimited, <clears throat> with different partners of ours, we're speaking with the World Economic Forum as a part, of saying, once you're done with us, what, you know, you're, you're with us, continue with the programming that exists with some of our partners, that's yeah. incredible. Yeah. So Generation Unlimited launched this, this week, a concept called Be Green, which is much deeper, much more in-person in certain countries and uh, uh, gives bigger funding. We have other funders from the UN that are doing similar programs. They each have their own speciality. And I think for us, what we're very excited about this year as well is to strengthen the programmatic relationships between us and existing initiatives or mm -hmm. new initiatives mm -hmm. so that you really have that journey. Start with us. We do our bit, which we're decent at. And then they you have, you have they, so they many continue others with practice. true experts who've been doing this for years. Yeah. They've got all the learnings. And they're specialists. Yeah. So until you reach a point where we had one of our investors say, listen, Taha, once you get through that funnel, now I want to put my capital. Yeah. Right. So everyone has yeah. their role. And the same can be said for every pathway. So I just wanted to share that because it's something I'm quite passionate about. But in order for us to scale, you need those downstream partners. But you also need, as we talked about, those governmental partners. Yeah. Cross-country partnerships. So yeah. we've started. We've got our first couple. But uh, you know, now we, we need to lock in you know, there's a lot more. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Give me the, give me the, give me the premium now. <laughs> the, the I'm school. saving that. I'm saving that. Yeah. Uh, we can, we can uh, have a podcast in Doha. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that will be the right place. Yeah. But Elias, actually, building on on your question as well, with respect to how the problem or the narrative around the problem yeah. that we're trying to address and solve for has changed, I would argue initially when we started, it was very, very quiet in our space. Mm. Um, right now, we know at every summit and conference we go to, everyone's talking about skills, but I'd still argue in many ways it remains a silent crisis, right? Uh, you would expect that we would notice if $8.5 trillion went missing, but that's really what's at stake wow. or what we risk losing, um, you know, that 8.5... Global economy, right? We're, global we're, yeah. economy. That actually corresponds to the loss in annualized revenue uh, globally by 2030 if we fail to close the skills gap yeah. and address the talent shortage coming yeah. from it. Yeah. You know, Todd touched on this earlier, but why, what's our take on this? If you think of it there, Tom mentioned there are a billion young people expected to enter this workforce by the end of this decade. Of that billion, however, 90% are from developing economies, yeah. right? But the way in which we today value and assess talent, if you take your typical resume, a CV, even LinkedIn profile, it's, it's, not work. it's based on four criteria, right? It's based on your work experience, yeah. it's based on your education, it's based on who you know. Yeah. 
And it's based on where you're from. Yeah. This was actually a big topic during during the panel. When it comes to where you're from, right? The majority of youth are from developing economies. We talked about Africa. Today, Africa is the youngest continent. Um, 60% of Africans are under the age of 25, yeah. 70% yeah. under 30, right? So that's where the, the talent really is. The second is, you know, where did they study? Um, it would be great if everyone could go to university. Reality is less than 38%, according to UNESCO, mm. benefit from a tertiary education. Mm. That includes skill training and so on today. And the third, where they worked. Catch 22, you need experience to get experience as a young person. And the fourth, who are you connected to? What's your network? Unless your parents are you know, not well connected, connected, you're not connected, right? Basically, as a young person, by default today, you're at an incredible disadvantage when you're kickstarting your career. Yeah. I, I have I wanted to ask a question uh, earlier on the panel, but I, I I wanted to give a chance to the audience, so I kind of but I want to ask it now, and this is based on on this increased you know population coming in and ma mainly the continent in Africa. If if we go back in history, and, and if we look at Europe uh, in in after the Second World War. They had a massive baby boom, and that's why they yeah. they they managed to create this beautiful economy that we're still benefiting from today. So it 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 the main ingredient was the young population, right? We have this in Africa. Why we're enabled? Is it governance? Is it what, what are some of the conditions that are enabling the continent? Because we have the most important condition, which is young people, the the, the greatest number of young people. What what is not enabling the continent to to just flourish, and I'm using the the mm -hmm. you know the years the European years after the the Second World War. I'd say one part of it, right? For eleven for every eleven young Africans who enter the workforce today, there are only three new jobs that are created. So one thing that is really missing is opportunity. There is maybe you could argue a talent surplus and an opportunity shortage across the continent. One thing Todd talked about was the importance of entrepreneurship yeah. and and when we say entrepreneurship we're not talking about thousand people companies no? yeah we're talking about micro companies as well like you just have to create your own jobs mm. but I, I let you continue yeah. and then i'll pick up on it yeah. it's i think there's a huge opportunity in both you know connecting more youth to local opportunities to remote opportunities globally we have to break down those boundaries i think the the pandemic gave us a taste yeah. Off it, right? 25% yeah. of work today is done remotely, remotely yeah. globally. Um, and then also creating new opportunities that don't already yeah. exist today. Um, there's... And, and I will add people movement. I mean, you will never stop that. Absolutely. And right now in the developed nation, you have so many, so, so, then the shortage of labor is so yeah. huge that, and, and the population. And you have an aging population. You have an aging population. There's no way yeah. to occupy these jobs except by bringing people from elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, that's that's just that's what the math seems to show. Um, I think, you know, coming back to your question, I think it's a really interesting question. Like, there's, there's it probably deserves its own, well, probably a book, um, mm. yeah. uh, let alone a podcast on it. It's very nuanced. But if I were to pick on a few points and not necessarily any particular order, um, there, there seems to be, you know, a lack, as you, as you said, there's a lack of opportunities for these young people to go into. So one is um, have the right skills, yeah. be assessed properly. But even if you do those two preconditions, which are, you know, still quite, uh, we're still quite a long way from achieving, mm. then you need to have the opportunities to access. And if we talk about entrepreneurship, you need one funding uh, as well. You need capital, but you also need the, the economic environment for that to happen in. Yeah. Um, and then if we talk about um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, let's say non-entrepreneurial, but actual jobs. They don't exist necessarily locally. Um, and even with the green transition that we hope is going to generate a lot of employment, you know, the, unless we can really harness the power of agriculture as a sector, yeah. it's hard to see how that's going to lead to the hundreds of millions of jobs that might be needed going forward. Yeah. So that is a that is a thing. I, I'm not super familiar about the the American post-war boom and what were the drivers, but I assume you know capital had a lot to to 
to do with that too. Okay. And that's the, the main ingredient. That well, I'm not sure if it's the main or, 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 it's, it's definitely yeah, it's, one. I think stability is another yeah, one. If we yeah. talk about big investments or yeah. a prerequisite for big investments. Um, but, but, but again, I think there's an opportunity to leapfrog, mm. let's say the, the, the conditions that were needed, you know, post world war two. And, and that's where perhaps we can leverage and harness technology and a movement yeah. to achieve that. Yeah. If we talk about, for sure, what you said about the migratory movements, I agree with in terms of there, there, there seems to be just a win-win there. But beyond that, if we talk about remote jobs or if we talk about entrepreneurship, um, if we talk about building up skills at scale, mm. can we leverage technology and can we leverage partnerships that have never been done before or movements that have never been done before? To achieve our goal, like if I take Generation Unlimited, or if I take the work we're doing, or the work Wise, there's some fantastic work. Yeah, or, yeah. Or, or or Wise, you know, where do we bring together partners so different from different parts of the world with different skill sets to achieve a common mission? And if we're actually able to work on those complementary skills, uh, complementary attributes, then maybe we'll be able to get to the goals faster. I give a concrete example of this. Um, um, you know, we're working at the moment with SAP, Accenture, and a few others to really deepen the ties programmatically mm. in skill development that exists, because a lot of the times these programs operate completely disparately. And, and you know, it's something we talked about earlier, Ilyas, organizations like the Qatar Foundation, like WISE, which are quite forward thinking, you know, and, and Generation Unlimited and others are, are, are able to see how can we leapfrog our current way of development? You know, how can we really come together and leverage each other's strengths? So I think that's what gives me hope from this week, where I see there's a real desire for that to come to happen. Now, I think we'll see where we are in two years, mm. but I think now we need to build on the momentum. Mm. You know, this has been proven. Generation Limited was a very, you know, was, was, was a novel concept a few years ago. I think mm -hmm. WISE was, or, or Qatar Foundation's approach was as well, but now it's becoming more and more accepted and mm -hmm. I think there's a chance now to say, okay, let's build on this momentum. We have all of these already in. Will you join? And this becomes the new status quo. That is a bit. I, I hope I was not too vague about that. But. No, no, you, you, you're, you're spot on actually because the way we've been adapting, the way even our organization have been created, have been trying to respond to the need of the reality of that time and context. And I think you, you have these organizations that can push others to change. Because we're agile, you know, and right now uh, the focus is is gonna be about okay, wh wherever wherever we invest has to be linked to, you know, what's the learning outcome, what's the what's the, the impact on whatever community or so. So I think the program have been mm -hmm. shifting, the way we look at things have been shifting. You know, we started with you know awards and all these things because we wanted to celebrate yeah. exceptional people, yeah. but right now it's no longer about that. It's about whatever you're doing yeah. is it solving the problem. And I think that's the mindset yeah. in, in a lot of places uh, right now. And uh, um, my question related to this topic, actually, because you, you've been working with a lot of organization, but also a lot of government. Yeah. yeah. How much uh, are they up to speed? I mean, it's mainly, mm -hmm. mainly, are, 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 are we, we are we bringing the whole government. ecosystem up to speed uh -huh. to, to, to the massive challenges that are ahead of us, or are we still you know, lacking, you know, or, or, or some stakeholders are still, yeah. some important stakeholders because it's, yeah. Yeah, are, are still not understanding that, oh, hold on, things are changing so fast. You yeah. said it, I mean, in five years, we're, we're, we're about to witness some transformational changes. Yeah. And so, so your experience and observation yeah. working with big corporation, but also big government, yeah. have you seen that, yes, everyone is tuned to, to to this or, or still there's a little bit of advocacy work that need to happen and education work that need to happen to bring everyone to the same mm. uh, line. I think there's two parts to it. And right? I don't want you to lose any friend no, at no, any no, government no, no, or no. any corporation. Yes. So. No, we, <laughs> so, we, we don't not. mention any no, name. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, I think there's two parts. One is um, do, do, do these critical stakeholders, as we say, we need government to achieve <clears throat> scale. Um, do these critical stakeholders understand the problem? That's point number one. And do these critical stakeholders have an action plan to, 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 to solve or start solving for the problem? Because as we're solving for the problem, the problem is also changing. Yeah. 
Um, so it's it's not only finding the solution, but it's finding the framework of working to solve the problem. Um, so I would say they're, they're what we're trying to do, which is why it's critical to include company. In my opinion, we have to include corporates in, even if they're responsible or not responsible for some of the problems we have in the solving of the problems. If we talk about climate, climate action, I believe, we believe, we have to work in hand in hand with the private sector and the public sector yeah. if we're to find solutions. Yeah. Regardless of how we feel about their past, about certain elements of their past, we yeah. need to bring them in because the alternative is worse, in yeah. our opinion. Yeah. I, I may be wrong, but that's no, my pragmatism at its best. Yeah. And then the second is on the case of governments, we're trying um, to speak to as many of them to include them in the co-creation, not just coming to them with a solution, but include them in the co-creation. We start off with the pilot, and then we grow with them. And they don't just, we don't just come in and execute with them. They bring something to the table. Mm -hmm. They support us with distribution. They bring, because a lot of the times they have existing initiatives of some sort. So how do we complement and integrate with those initiatives and build on top of them? Yeah. In some cases, we really have to do a bit. And that's where generation, I say we, Generation Unlimited has to do quite a lot of work, for example, in helping shape some of that policy. Um, but, but I think a lot of the times with these institutions, you know, an institution, you have the biggest names, but what really makes the difference is the people. Hmm. So you might have 400,000 employees, but actually one person within that organization can lead a lot of change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we're very fortunate that a lot of our partners and a lot of the people we come across are really engaged, are really passionate. And, you know, and that's where events like WISE are so critical to bring together these different stakeholders, to energize them, bring them up to speed with best practices, mm. and then say, come on this journey with us. Yeah. Because the desire is there, but sometimes, even there, I think someone mentioned, you also have to train the other institutions, not just the young people. Yeah. 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 Uh, going back to the core, and, and it, it's, it's maybe my final, or before the final question, uh, Omar, uh, going back to the core of, of you know, what, what you do, which is, which is focus on youth, uh, what will be the advice you will give uh, young people listening to us uh, to face and, and, and dream about the future and, and whatever aspiration they have, yeah, what would be some of the things you, you would want to share? In many ways, I think Ta put it quite, quite nicely in the panel, the future is very uncertain. The last thing I would want to do is predict what that future looks mm -hmm. like. Um, I think the World Economic Forum said, or predicted, estimated, there are going to be 85 million jobs displaced by automation, artificial intelligence. 2030, right? Or 20, yeah. yeah. In a very short time frame. In the same time, though, 95 million new jobs, jobs and roles yeah. will be created. So there's a huge opportunity, right? Many of the jobs that exist today won't exist tomorrow. Many of the jobs that will exist tomorrow don't already exist. Mm. So if you're a young person, you know, preparing for this uncertainty, what you what you focus on, what you invest in. And that's where, you know, I come back, taking it back to the core of Goodwall and focus on those core transferable skills, creativity, communication, problem solving, skills that are valuable, irrespective of whichever career you pursue, right? Um, that's one part of the, the, the question. The other is strengthening some of those, what you call competencies or attitudes, mm -hmm. right? Like resilience, grit, adaptability, confidence. These are all key, irregardless of the uncertain future we've yeah. got ahead of us, whether it's because of automation, artificial intelligence, or the green transition. Yeah. We, yeah. It, it, if, if, I may, if I may add to that, I think I was just, I was just thinking in, about a couple of conversations we've had with young people over the course of the week. The challenges in front of us are, are big, for sure. But the opportunities are, are, are enormous as well. And, and this may be one of the most exciting times to have been alive on this planet. And I just want to emphasize that. I know it's super hard for a lot of young people around the world, but, but let's speak about action. Mm -hmm. What I would like to hear less of is all the challenges we're facing on panels. So over the course of this week, you know, a lot of people go on, there's a lack of this, there's a lack of that, this yeah, isn't working. But, but I would like to hear, okay, we are lying on that. Now, but what, are you, what is your view on this? Or what do you think we need to do together to get there? Who can help with that? Mm -hmm. And I think we've tried in our own small way to, to move the needle. And now if we could get other young people to say, look, me too, I might not be perfect, 
I might make mistakes, I might fail, but I'm gonna try and move the needle in my small way. Yeah. And I think this is what we need right now because I think if we can come together and each one of us contribute in our small way, we can actually move forward. Um, and I think we need to move away from this, 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 this fatalism. Yeah. Because like I say on a personal level, uh, people ask me, you know, what do you think is going to, do you think you're going to make a difference? And I say to make a dent, we need to reach like 100 million people, mm -hmm. which is why we work on partnerships and mm -hmm. technology and so on. But I'm going to give everything I have to try and get there. Yeah. And if I'm not able to get all the way, I would have done hopefully something useful. Yeah. 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 But I can't think about all the things that are holding me back. I can't think about lack of connecti connectivity because that I cannot control. Yeah. I, I don't have access to $20 billion in infrastructure funding. But what I can do is partner with the local telecom and get zero rating. This I can do. Mm -hmm. So I'd say like, let's focus on what we can control as individuals and let's do the best at that. And hopefully that will be enough because the alternative is definitely worse. Yeah, yeah. She adding on that, I think Ty, you kind of touched on this, but 60% of youth wake up with climate anxiety today. The reality is you take that crisis in particular, it's a very complex problem to solve for. And oftentimes, and I've heard this throughout this week, there's a lot of uh, responsibility shifting where you push it onto, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to take individual action because we're not taking collective action or I'm not going to take collective action because the private sector aren't doing their fair share or the government isn't. And the reality is, I think there was this Oscar, it won an Oscar, right? The, the name of the movie, everything all at once right now, something like that. Yeah. And that's kind of what we need yeah. today. It's, we can't work in isolation. None of this works, right? If you don't take your individual action, you know, uh, it influences government policy and it influences, um, you know, the, the way in which private sector supplies the economy. So it's all connected and that requires taking action today, irrespective of how small you might think it is in the grand scheme of things. Actually, sorry, Ilias, <laughs> now that we speak about taking action, and it just, by action, we don't mean, I don't mean, you know, getting young people, you know, just limiting that and <clears throat> offsetting your carbon footprint with, with flights and so on. Mm -hmm. I think, and this is why the program we've run with, uh, we're, we're launching now private sector partners, the UN and various others called Green Rising is about helping equip young people to take action through their future livelihoods. Mm. So we look at entrepreneurship. Let's talk about entrepreneurship or ecopreneurship that works with nature rather than against it. That's a livelihood. That's a long-term solution. If we talk about advocacy, I'm not talking about doing it as a volunteer. I'm talking about how can we help prepare them for a career in policy? Yeah. The next generation of policymakers have to be at another level, but we need to help them. And then finally for jobs, again, if you're working at some of the biggest companies in supply chain, how can we help equip you with the mindset and the skill set to make a difference? Yeah. So it has to be part of your, your job because for 99% of the population, you, know, you have to earn a living, you, you have certain responsibilities, and that has to happen in a conjunction of making the world a better place rather than saying we're going to expect young people to volunteer their time yeah. and to fix yeah. all of our problems yeah. but on the side. Yeah. This is, this is brilliant. And, and look, we can touch upon on many other topics. Uh, but one is I want to be respectful of, of, of your time. We promised you about 40 minutes. We're already beyond. But <laughs> what, what we can do is uh, usually we do 40 minutes per, per speaker. Now we've done this with two speakers. So we need part two. Because <laughs> I do want to touch, I do want to deep dive a little bit more into this anxiety, but the, 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 the mental um, issues we're, we're facing with young people. I see it with even my nieces and nephews. They're studying university and, and, and it's tough, man. I mean, I, I, I've been witnessing personally these things. So these are not, these are real examples. Then uh, I'd love to hear more from you from, from this new tools of AI and how this is going to you know, support your own uh, uh, technology, but also how it's going to affect the, the, the other, other stuff. So. I, I, I'm really happy about this conversation together. Thank you, and we will do more things together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elias. Thank you for having us.